we have um, Congressman Ronnie Jackson on with us. I, I read something uh, that he has said, and he's got a new book coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, but I read something that he, he was talking about on President Biden and, if, you know, is, is he mentally stable? And I hate people who play doctor, uh, except he actually is a doctor. In fact, he was the, uh, the White House doctor, the president's doctor for three presidents. And I wanted to get him on the phone. Hi, Ronnie. How are you, sir? Thank you, guys. I appreciate y'all having me. Okay, I can't hear him now, but I can hear him through something, speaker of some sort. So, uh, Ronnie, um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about President Biden, because you are somebody who has been a presidential doctor for three presidents. You just left. Uh, And do you know Joe Biden? Have you interacted with Joe Biden? Yeah, absolutely. I know Joe Biden. You know, I was at the White House for eight years, so I was around him on a regular basis. I wasn't his physician. I wasn't clinically responsible for him. But I did oversee the medical team that took care of him. Uh, You know, uh, I was the director of the White House Medical Unit. So the doctors and the nurses that provided care to the VP side of the house uh, reported to me. Uh, But, yeah, I was around him a lot, uh, you know, at events in the White House and in the West Wing. So I I do know him. Okay, Um, And, you know, I don't take it lightly. Um, I didn't like it when people were saying that, you know, Donald Trump was, uh, you know, mentally unfit. You may have disagreed with him and you may have thought he was erratic. uh, But, you know, there was a method to his quote unquote madness. Um, But he wasn't he wasn't somebody who was losing it, in my opinion. Uh, He is I've just talked to him recently. He is extremely sharp. Um, But Joe Biden, you can see the decline in him. And I, I, I don't I mean, we are in such a precarious position is this guy fit for office? No, he's not fit for office, Glenn. I'll tell you, I was saying that when he was candidate Joe Biden, and you're right. There's a big difference. The far left, the elites in academic medicine, uh, the mainstream media were just coming after me relentlessly about President Trump. But it was because they didn't like the nature of his tweets. They didn't like his style. Uh, they didn't, you know, th- th- it was his personality that they didn't like. He wasn't. He did nothing to to demonstrate or to raise any concerns that he had any cognitive decline. But we did a we did a physical exam. We did a cognitive test as well. Uh, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we've set the standard now. That's the precedent. But Joe Biden is a different story. Joe Biden, you can go back, and I've said this before, you can look at 40 years of tape of this man. He's always been prone to gaffes, but these aren't gaffes anymore. Something serious, something seriously no. wrong with him now from a cognitive standpoint. He doesn't know where he's at, what he's doing. He's confused. He looks frail. He shuffles when he walks. He slurs his speech. All signs and symptoms of age-related cognitive decline of some sort. And he does not need to be our commander-in-chief and our head of state if he's not really, you know, if he's not 100%. So I know that, for instance, the Secret Service actually controls the president's uh, body and presence. If the president says, I want to go and I, I'm going to stand right here and they disagree with him because of security, they can say, Mr. President, I'm sorry, we've got to move because he belongs to the, 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 the people and the, and the state and constitutionally they can they have to protect him. Um, and so he can be overridden at times. Is there anything like this with with medical care? Is there anybody that is in a position that should say, uh, excuse me, uh, the, this guy is not capable or is it only his cabinet? No, there's a variety of people. I mean, a lot of people around him have a responsibility to make sure that they're serving the country, the way they were sworn to do so. First and foremost would be his his physician. I know his physician well. The guy worked for me for eight years. Uh, his name is Kevin O'Connor. He's he's not. I would say he's not a great physician. He stayed with uh, Biden for the eight years because he and Biden, uh, you know, became really close friends. And and I think that that's the reason that he's there right now is his physician because he's willing to ignore and cover up anything that's going on and help uh, you know push this forward. There, a lot of these people should have stopped him from becoming the, the, the nominee, first and foremost, was Jill Biden. So I would say Jill Biden, the president's yeah. personal physician, Kevin O'Connor, uh, the president's cabinet, uh, even the vice president. You know, we have the 25th Amendment, which allows the vice president, along with the majority of the president's cabinet, to uh, to come to Congress and remove him from office. I mean, 
I, I know they've considered that. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure they have, but I don't know that they'll go down that path. But they're all looking for a way to get rid of him now. But they should have never put him in this position. But people were consumed. They were consumed with the thought of going to the White House and working in the West Wing. And that includes Jill Biden being first lady. And it includes all of the Obama folks. Uh, Obama had a responsibility, in, in my mind, to stop this. But I think that they were looking at the opportunity to put a whole bunch of Obama people back into the West Wing. And, it, and they've done just that, led by Susan Rice. So I think there were a lot of other people that were looking after their own interest and in ignoring the disaster that we have now. I know that President Obama has, uh, has written you a letter and said, you know, shame on you. I, 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 you know, I consider you a friend and, and everything else. Uh, and shame on you for for talking about Joe Biden this way. Yeah, he did. You know, I uh, it happened a couple of years ago, back in February Ronnie, are you there? twenty. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh, he did it. He wrote me a letter. It happened a, few, a couple of years ago, back in February of 2020. And you know, I, I, it's out now because I wrote a book called Holding the Line, and I, I wrote about it in the book. But uh, I just I retweeted something that Rona McDaniel had sent out, where she was uh, had uh, tweeted out a clip of. The, of the candidate, Joe Biden, when he was confused about what office he was running for and, and what state he was in. And I was just frustrated right. with the hypocrisy and the double standard. And so I retweeted that with a pretty benign tweet, I thought, on my part, where I just said, hey, does anybody remember the cognitive test that I gave at real Donald Trump, the one that he ate? Looks like somebody else needs a test. Scary. That was <laughs> the extent of it. It wasn't, it wasn't that big a deal. But within 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, I, you know, my phone's like, ding, and I get this email from President Obama just completely reading me the right act, you know, just scolding me uh, pretty, pretty harshly. He started off talking about how he, you know, thought of me as a friend and I it was a great physician, yada, yada. And then he basically, he, he just broke down to this is, I can't believe the cheap shot you took at Joe Biden. This is beneath you as a, as a Navy admiral. This is beneath you as a physician to the president. Uh, this is a direct assault on me and my family and the people that, you know, that you served in, the, in, in my White House. And I hope that you use better judgment in the future. And I'm just really disappointed in you. Uh, it, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Wow. Please tell me you have that frame hanging over like your fireplace or something. <laughs> I, I would, I I'd wear that I, as a badge of honor. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do. And I, I, I put it in the book as well. So everyone else can see it as well. But, you know, I didn't know what to do with it, to be honest with you. I, I, I kind of, I tell people, it, it kind of had a weird effect on me. It was kind of a combination between being a little bit upset and angry about receiving it and also having my feelings hurt just a little bit, you know, but I had a pretty close personal relationship with all three of the presidents that I served with Bush, Obama and Trump. And uh, it just, it, it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, but uh, I thought about it and I was going to, I was going to reply. And then I decided I was going to pick the phone up and call him, but I was late for a fundraiser, went to the fundraiser, came out of the fundraiser and I was going to make the phone call. And I thought to myself, before I make this phone call, so I don't say something I regret, I'm going to call somebody who I think might understand kind of the position I'm in. So I called Dan Bongino because Dan and I have been good friends with Dan was at Secret Service and during the Obama administration. And I knew he would kind of understand the weird situation that I was in. I called him and he said, Ronnie, he said, you don't owe this man a damn thing. You don't owe him anything. He goes, did he lift a single finger to help you when you were getting butchered by the left and by John Tester and all these people with this made up garbage during your nomination for the VA secretary? One phone call from him and he knew it was all garbage. He knew it was it, that it was all false. He could have picked the phone up, made one phone call and put all that to bed. But he didn't bother to help you. You don't owe him anything. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? He's absolutely right. I don't know this guy anything. And I just let it go. I didn't re I didn't reply to the email. And I haven't said a word about it until it came out in my book. Uh, it was leaked out of my book, which is coming out uh, a week from today. Uh, and the name of your book again? It's called Hold it, Holding the Line. All right. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have you back after, you know, give me a chance to read it and, and uh, have you back. Because I'm, I'm fascinated the, you know, somebody who has been with three different presidents and worked in the White House, um, and you used to see, you were the first person, was this with all presidents or just Donald Trump? I was with Trump and first Obama. You know, during the the Bush. Yeah, yeah, that was, with, uh, that was with Trump and Obama. During the Bush administration, I was around President Bush a lot. I traveled with him. I went to the ranch with him a lot. Things, I got to know him very well, and he was from Texas, and so I was kind of, uh, you know, part of that West Texas crowd in, in the White House. 
But, you know, I was the junior physician during the Bush administration. During the Obama administration and the Trump administration, I was the appointed physician to the president, which means that my office was on the ground floor of the White House directly below the president's bedroom. So every morning when the president, whether it was Obama or Trump, came down, I was a a lot of times the first person they would see in the morning, the last person they would see in the evening. And in particular with President Trump. I would meet him down there in the morning because I didn't really know him very well when he first came on board. I was trying to get to know him a little bit. So that first week, I'd, you know, I'd hear the Secret Service call out. He was on the, on the radio because I have an earpiece in listening to them all the time. I'd hear him call out that he's coming down the elevator. I'd go to the door, stand there. And when he'd come down, I'd say, good morning, Mr. President. And, you know, uh, he, he's up for about three hours before anybody else even shows up at the White House, you know, watching TV and tweeting and talking on the phone. And believe me, by the time he drops down that elevator, he's looking for somebody to talk to. And so he'd see me standing there and he'd be like, Doc, did you see this? Did you see that? And, you know, it'd be nothing to do with medical. It could be whatever. It could, you know, it could have been, you know, Iran. It could have been Stormy Daniels. It's just whatever, you know. And uh, so I'd say, yes, sir. And we'd start a conversation. He'd go walk with me. So I'd walk him to work. I'd walk him down the West Colonnade, down the Oval Colonnade, right into the back of the Oval Office. And, you know, the National Security Advisor, the CIA briefer, the chief of staff, whoever would be in the outer Oval waiting to come in. And when I'd finish up, I'd walk out. They'd walk in as they would start. But I got to I developed a really close personal relationship uh, with with Trump because of that interaction that I had with him on a regular basis. Um, we we're talking to Congressman Ronnie Jackson. He's from uh, Texas. He was the uh, White House physician for three presidents, Bush, uh, Obama and President Trump, and has a new book out called Holding the Line where you can read the letter that President Obama uh, sent to Ronnie saying, you know, how dare you say this about uh, Joe Biden? But it, con- it is concerning, I think, not just to Republicans. I think it concerns all Americans. Um, any American that is honest can see that there are times that this president has uh, completely checked out. Um, and the only real solution is the 25th Amendment, but that has to be done by the vice president, and I think it's two thirds. Did you say two thirds of the cabinet? It's, it, I believe the Twenty Fifth Amendment says a majority of the cabinet and the vice president. Okay, good. All right, uh, Ronnie, thank you so much. We'll talk again. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate it.